Hello. Well, actually, just a second. Hello, I'm um, David. I'm the coordinator of the Maths Learning Centre, and this is a revision seminar for Maths 1B. It's semester 2, 2021. Uh, and uh, welcome everyone who's here live and welcome to you if you're watching in the future. Um, hello from the past. I hope things are better there. Um, so we're going to uh, start off uh, with some requests that people have asked um, and they are, I'm going to start with um, sequences and series stuff. So uh, I'm just going to share my camera. Right. So if we're going to talk about this, I want to drill a bit further down into how people are feeling about the sequences and series um, and anything that they're wondering about at the moment. Um, if you've got any specific questions that came up in Mobiuses or tubes or whatever's that you're not sure how you want to deal with or you just want to talk about um, or you thought were cool, whatever, any of those things, um, think about them for a moment while I start writing and then um, let me know. All right. Would anyone like to share a more specific question than sequences and series before I get going? Like something that's further down than just the whole topic. Um, I guess more specifically I want to start with that and then I think the series and mm -hmm. how that works and the idea of like what that narrows into the All right, cool. Just so I don't miss anything. Anything else? Don't forget you on Zoom, you can stick things in the chat. Ah, oh, I know what that noise is. The air conditioner. Air conditioner in this room whines if you don't open one of the doors. Okay, if you think of something along the way, just let me know, okay? Um, it, I don't mind if people add in questions that aren't really directly relevant right at this exact moment. If you just think of it at the time, I'll write it down and we'll get back to it later. Cool. All right. So we've got one in recognizing forms of sequences and series uh, so that you can sort of use them. All right. Sweet. I'll come back to that in a bit. All right. Let me just ponder for a moment and collect my thoughts on this. Okay. Right. I'm going to start at the end um, and then fill in the other bits later. Um, but I thought it would be really important to sort of talk about some of that Taylor stuff at the beginning. Um, right. In Mass 1B, as far as I can tell from the way the course is written, that yes, that would be useful, thank you. From the way the series, where your course is written, Taylor series is the main goal of talking about series. Now you do some fiddling around with those things because mathematicians can't help playing with any idea that comes up. But the, the thrust of it is to get to the Taylor series at the end and going, yes, these are the thing. Um, so that's why I'm starting at the end here to, uh, with the Taylor series. So just have a, a, an idea of what that is about. So um, the point of Taylor series is to attempt to write all functions as polynomials because polynomials are nice. All right. Uh, 
So polynomials are nice. Polynomials have been known since before even we had notation for polynomials. Um, people understood the concept of, of um, powers and suck, chucking in values of x even before we had x to use. Like before there was algebra notation, people knew about polynomials. So we've been studying for a, for a while um, and they're really nice. Okay, that you know they've got roots. If you've got x to the power of n, you know that um, plus crap, then you know that it has a certain number of humps and you would expect and places to cross the x-axis and, and they're lovely and the derivatives of them are really easy to figure out relative to all other functions. Um, uh, and they're really nice to teach a computer to calculate because it's all just multiplying and, and adding. Um, computers are good at that from the beginning of computers, even before we had electronic computers and we just had engines that you turn cranks, they were designed to do multiplication and addition. So they're really nice. You know, we really understand them at a deep level, mathematicians. Um, and we would really prefer if all functions were polynomials, but they're just not, um, which is sad. Uh, so um, it would be nice if we could represent all functions as polynomials, which we can't do, but you know, this is our attempt to do it. That's basically the story, okay? That's the goal. I talked about this in many a revision seminar, um, so I might not be doing the best job here, um, and other ones might be a better job, um, but just giving you the vibe here. The goal is to rewrite your function as a polynomial. And so you might have some wicked ass function. Some weird crap. And what you would prefer is it to be something like this. Like that, because this is lovely. So there are two ways to get around the fact that functions are not polynomials. One of those ways is to stop at some point and go, I know it's not a polynomial, but maybe if I went on long enough, it would be approximately correct. So one of those ways is to stop and go, yep, this is good enough for today. My function isn't a polynomial, but it's pretty close to this one. And I'm happy with how close it is. And then you're going to have to start talking about how bad is the error? Um, how bad, how different is this from my actual function? And the other way of coping with it is to go, oh yeah, but what if I just did this forever? And then it would be equal in some sort of foreverness equal concept in the same way that this number is not equal to one third, and this number is not equal to one third, and this number is not equal to one third, and this number is not equal to one third. And if you stop at any point, it's never equal to one third, but if I went forever, then it is some, in some sense, equal to one third. It's the same idea as repeating decimals, um, in that if you stop at any point, it's not equal, but if you go forever, it is. And we've been um, fooling ourselves that we're comfortable with repeating decimals for you know, many years, maybe 10 years for you and longer for me, uh, um, fooling yourself you're comfortable with repeating decimals for that long. And you are, you're okay with it. You're okay with it. You go, all right, whatevs. I've, you know, I've become accustomed to this idea, but if I think about it too hard, I feel a bit freaked out, but I'm okay with it. That's what we're going to do with um, the Taylor series as well. So what they call it is if you stop at some point, it's called a Taylor polynomial, but if you go forever, it's called a Taylor series. How are people feeling at this point? Got any questions you want to ask that may or may not be related to what I'm talking about now, but you happen to think of in the intervening time? Awesome. Told you I would stop every so often and ask. So I just want to make sure I keep my promise there. Okay.
So what we're going to do is we're going to use a really cool fact about the way polynomials behave um, to figure out what the correct polynomial is. If your function really was equal to a polynomial, watch this. If I put in f of zero, then I get a naught plus a one times zero plus a two times zero squared plus and so on. And all of this is zero. And so I get a naught. So if I wanted to know what a zero was, what the correct a zero to choose was, then what I should do is I should sub in f zero into my function. And whatever the answer is, is the correct number to go in this spot. Now your function itself, probably has a whole different way of figuring out what the answers for the function are. It might be e to the power of x or sine x or random crap. And it has its own method for figuring it out. But now we know that whatever method you use to figure out what f of zero is, whatever the answer is, is the correct number to go in this spot if you wanted to rewrite it as a polynomial. And we're gonna reuse this idea over and over. Because if I wanna know what a1 is, I'm gonna to need to separate this from the x here. Any number of other x that I sub in, if I put in a one here, I'll get a naught plus a one plus a two, and that's not necessarily all that helpful. But if I differentiate it, then that will disappear. The a one will still be there. The a two will still be there, but it'll be times by two x now. And then the next one, there'll be a a three, would it be times by three x squared and so on. And now if I sub in zero into this, all of that disappears and I'm left with the number in that spot. So if I know how to find the derivative, and then I can sub in zero, and it will tell me the correct answer to go what goes in this place here. Let's do it again, f double dashed. If I do the second derivative, that bit disappears, and I'm left with a2 times two, and I'll have a3 times three times two x, and now if I sub in x equals zero, all this disappears, that's great, but I'm left with twice the number I was hoping for. Why is that there? I'm left with twice the number I was hoping for. So if I want the correct number, I'm gonna to have to divide by two. And when I get to the third one, I'm going to end up with uh, a3 times 3 times 2 plus, and then it'll be crap here. And so f triple dashed of 0 is going to be. So if I want to know what a3 is, I'm going to have to divide this by 3 times 2. And that 3 times 2 is there because they came down from the power when I did the derivative. When I had x cubed, and I divided it by, and I kept doing the derivative, the three came down and then the two came down and technically the one came down. Um, if I want the fourth derivative of x to the power of four, four comes down, three comes down, two comes down, I'm gonna get four times three times two. And that means that if I want to know what the coefficient in position n is, then I'm gonna to have to do the nth derivative sub n zero and divide by n factorial and it will give me the correct answer which is really cool. And this will work for polynomials. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, if it really was a polynomial, then these would be the correct coefficients. And so that's the coefficients I'm gonna to use to make my best polynomial um, to approximate my function. Yeah, cool. All right, giving you opportunity to, to ask questions. So what's normally presented in uh, the lecture notes for a course like this is just something like this. This is the formula for the correct polynomial in this position. In fact, it's not even written this way. It just has this thing in those spots. But that's where it comes from. All right. Now I will say something else. 
Um, there is something else about Taylor series that we've seen as well, and it doesn't just have to be X in this spot here. It could be something else. And you've seen that before as well. Watch this. Perfectly good polynomial, it's already a polynomial. This is its Taylor series um, with center zero. Um, but usually with something like quadratics, for the purposes of sketching, if you haven't got a machine to do it for you, um, there's a thing called completing the square where you would rewrite it in a format that is easier for the purposes of finding where the vertex is. And so you'd go, uh, well, I divide this number by two uh, and that would be three. And then I'd really like there to be a three squared, which is nine. So I can't just go adding a nine, I'll have to take it off as well. And then this bit is guaranteed to be X plus three squared. And this bit is uh, ooh, 13 minus nine, which is four. And so now I have completed the square. which is lovely, but look what I've done. I have rewritten this function as also a quadratic, but with an X plus three in the spot where you'd think an X would normally go. This is a Taylor series with center zero because the X's are just X's. This is a Taylor series with center minus three. And that minus three is where the vertex of this um, parabola is. So I mean, I'll draw it over here at minus three plus four. So it is actually possible to, to uh, completing the square is the choice of what you, uh, is the choice of center that means there's no X term, which is really cool. I'm gonna show you something. Watch this, ready? Uh, before I do that, just gonna clarify. This is also a Taylor series. This is a Taylor series. Center minus three. In lots of the notes, they would call this number A, but sometimes they call it C. Um, I prefer not to give it a letter because it freaks me out. Um, it's the center. Sometimes they say it's the center. Sometimes they just say it's at minus three. Sometimes they say it's about minus three. Just be careful. Anything that gives you a general concept of location when it talks about a Taylor series is what that number is. And so it's minus whatever's here. It's traditional to have it as X minus A like that. So here's the thing. If I wanted to know what these correct coefficients were, I can't sub in x equals zero. Because when x is zero, I get um, a naught plus a one times minus a plus a two times minus a squared. I'm gonna to need to sub in something that makes all these things equal to zero, which means I need to sub in a because a minus a is zero and a minus a is zero. And so that means that these correct coefficients are f the nth, this one is, this one is the first derivative at A, which is just F dashed. And this one is the second derivative at A divided by two. And then the third one would be the third derivative divided by three factorial and so on. And so A N is the nth derivative. This brackets notation is designed to make derivatives at a divided by n factorial. And the reason you need to be a is so that these things work out to be zero when you sub it in. And the way that the derivatives are happening here is using the chain rule. You have two times x minus a, and then times by the derivative of this, which is one anyway. And so that works out fine. All right, uh, I would ask at this point questions, but I'm gonna do one more thing. 
So the cool thing I was going to show you was watch what happens when I attempt to find the Taylor series for this function at x equals minus three. So Taylor. Okay, so see how it says at, that means that I'm talking about the center um, of this. So um, here we go. F of minus three is minus three squared plus six times minus three plus 13, which is nine minus 18 plus 13, which is minus nine plus 13, which is four. F dash of X is two X plus six. And F dash of minus three is two times minus three plus six, which is zero. Okay, so this is telling me that that the coefficient of constant coefficient is four. And this is telling me that A1 will be F dash of minus three divided by one factorial, which is zero divided by one, which is zero. And F double dash of X is two, because it's the derivative of that. And so F double dash of minus three is still two because it doesn't involve an X. It will be the same answer, answer no matter what X is. And therefore the coefficient of X squared is going to be F double dash of minus three divided by two factorial, which is two divided by two, which is one. And so therefore, and F triple dash of X is zero and every derivative after that will be zero. So all the other coefficients are all zero. And so that means that f of x is now four plus zero times x plus three plus one times x plus three squared, which is exactly what I got when I completed the square. Yay. I mean, that, that's not how to complete the square. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but because uh, <laughs> you have to pick the correct center. Um, so if I had chosen something other than minus three, this wouldn't have been a zero and there would have been a four and a something X plus something and a something X plus something squared. And that would have been fine. But the idea of completing the square is the same idea as choosing a good center for your Taylor series. So let me just wrap that up. We wanna rewrite function as, thank you. <laughs> as polynomial. So we wanna rewrite my existing function is rewritten as polynomial. Like that. And this thing is called a Taylor series center A, center at X equals A. Um, and um, the correct, answer for the nth coefficient. So the coefficient of X to the N is the nth derivative subbing in A divided by N factorial. If you stop at X to the power of N, then it's called a Taylor polynomial. So you pick an N and you stop there and go, no, I'm not gonna do any more then it's called, it's called Taylor polynomial. And you normally call it P N X, which is really not helpful because it doesn't tell you what the center is. And so you're gonna to have to always tell people what the center is. But if you go forever, it's called a Taylor series. Okay. Questions, thoughts? If you have, if you're a working mathematician, you get to choose what the center is. If you're in a maths one B exam, they'll just tell you. Uh, because they want you to be able to do it for any center. Almost all the time, people choose the center to be zero. Um, and because Maclaurin did that before Taylor did all the other ones, it's usually called a Maclaurin polynomial if you search for things online. 
um, center x equals zero is called a polynomial or series. And they're the most common because it's way easier to just do like just x in this spot than x minus number. Um, and most functions that we care about have really nice Maclaurin polynomials slash series, um, but um, some of them don't. In particular, you can't use x equals zero if your function is not actually defined when x is zero, uh, which causes problems with functions like ln um, or other logarithms. And so they're often done with their center at one. Um, yeah. Okay, that's great. So now let's look closer at this. This thing, this polynomial is made up of a sum of a whole lot of pieces and each piece has an extra power of X or X minus A. Um, and that means that we're actually really interested uh, in things that are sums of powers of X. And those are called power series. So the word series in mathematics has been chosen to mean sum of pieces. And so we're really interested in power series. And the thing about a power series is that if you put different X's in, you get different answers. It's a totally, it's totally a function. Um, if I had X equals one, it would be A naught plus A1 plus A2 plus and whatever that answer is. And if I had X is uh, five, I'd get five and then 125 in this spot and we'd be adding up those things. And if X was 0 0.1, I'd get 0.1 and then 0.01 and then 0.001. And so all these things would um, get smaller and smaller. And the question we want to know is, if I've got a formula for what these are, then how do I tell if it actually gives an answer or if it's just stupid? Like, because if I was adding up one plus five plus five squared plus five cubed forever, that would so not be a number because it would be just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like just the terms themselves are getting bigger and the sum is getting even more bigger. Um, and so that wouldn't be anything at all. Uh, and so I want to know for which numbers can I put into this? Does it actually produce an answer? And I also want to know what does it even mean to add up infinitely many things? That's a, that's a question. Now we have been blithely assuming that we know what that means when we do this. This is already a power series. Well, one answer from a power series, because this is, this is like uh, three tenths and this is three hundredths and this is three like that forever. And that's the same as three times 0 0.1 plus three times 0 0.1 squared plus three times 0 0.1 cubed plus, it's a power series. It's an answer from a power series when X is 0 0.1. We've been doing this for a long time and just believing that it's okay. Mathematicians are not comfortable with that. Um, well, they're okay as long as somebody believe, uh, has, has proved it's okay. Um, it is distressing how many people are okay with things that um, if that somebody has enough, um, enough fame, then they're okay to believe it. But we really should not believe that sort of thing. People with fame tend to have uh, be people with privilege and not that they don't deserve the glory, but a lot of other people deserve glory too. So we're gonna move on from there and we're going to make sure we understand it ourselves. And 0 0.333 repeater and 0 0.111 repeater, um, they change these bits, but don't change these bits. Okay. So we want to believe that that'll work. And so we need a way of what it does even mean to add up infinitely many things. And our rule for adding up infinitely many things is that if you have a running total of what you're up to so far, that that sequence appears to go somewhere. And that's why we talk about both sequences and series. So I'm now going to go back to the beginning and start there. All right.
So for a mathematician, a sequence is just a list of numbers. Perfectly good sequence. And for most mathematicians, a sequence is something that goes on forever. And there's usually some sort of pattern to it, but there doesn't have to be a pattern to it. Perfectly good sequences are um, the digits of pi. It's a perfectly good sequence doesn't go anywhere in particular. It's just, well, it's not random. The digits are decided by the value of pi. It's totally not random. It just feels random to us um, who can't see what process is producing those numbers. Um, most sequences that we care about are ones where there is a process that we can figure out what it is. Um, this one was just the odd numbers. There is a process, each one is two more than the one before, and the formula for it, um, this is position n, is a 2n minus one, for example. Yeah, that's counting this as position one. If this was position zero, then it'd be 2n plus one, um, because that would work out like that. Um, there'd be one like this, one, minus one, one, minus one, one, minus one, one, minus one. Classic, just flips back and forth between one and minus one. Happens when you do um, every second power of the number i, like the complex number i. Um, and also happens if you do um, every power of the number minus one. The even powers come out to be um, the pluses and the odd powers come out to be the minuses. For it to be this formula, you would need that one to be position zero. Um, if you want to start with a plus, if you want to start with a minus, that you can make this position one and that'll work or you would have to do an n plus one or an n minus one or something. So that's what sequences are. And some sequences go somewhere. So if I had one, uh, if I had uh, a half and three quarters and seven eighths and uh, 15 sixteenths and 31 30 seconds and 63 60 fourths and uh, 127 128 and so on, it's a perfectly good sequence. Um, and these numbers are getting closer and closer to one because the, the gap between them and one is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because this is only one 128th away from one. And so this thing, which is um, two to the n minus one over two to the n, gets closer and closer to one as n goes to, get, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what we say is that the limit as n goes to infinity of this is one. Because that's where it looks like it's going. Never gets there, not quite, but, closer. Um, and um, if you do real analysis too, um, ever, in the one day, um, just know that real analysis too is, is quite a lot of effort. But the people in the course are usually very friendly. Um, and the Mass Learning Centre staff in particular, me, are really like doing real analysis too, so you can talk to us about it. But if you do real analysis too, um, that we have an extremely rigorous meaning of what that means to get closer. Um, the idea is that if you pick a distance away from one that you want to be, um, then there is a point at which all the terms further on are within that distance. I want to be with, within 0.001 of, of the number one, then there is a point at which n is big enough, they'll all be within that distance and I can just get closer than that as far as I go. So however close I want to be, I can get that close. Whereas this thing doesn't have a limit at all. It just flips back and forth between one and minus one. There's no single single number that it gets close to. If you pick a number like zero, then it's always exactly one away from zero. And if you pick a number like a half, sometimes it's exactly half away and sometimes it's one and a half away, but it never gets any closer than that. And so this one doesn't have a limit. So the limit as n goes to infinity of minus one to the n does not exist. And this, Limit doesn't exist either. That doesn't exist either because there's no one number that it gets close to. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And some mathematicians are okay with writing equals infinity. 
other mathematicians not so much. I think your lecturers are okay with the equals infinity, or at least they're okay with you saying it. Sanjeeva who wrote the notes is okay with it, but other people who teach it, maybe not so much. Um, that's one of the things that mathematicians haven't settled down on being, uh, being all right with, with notation. So some would say it just doesn't exist. And some would say, yeah, it doesn't exist, but is equal to, in, in inverted commas, infinity. Good -o. But the ones we really care about are the ones that actually really is properly equal to a number. And um, you need to know your limit laws to do that, which is a whole other seminar. Um, yep. There's only one limit law that is really very important. Um, maybe two. There's one, there's a whole collection of them that says that, oh, you know, if you do the sum first and you do the limit before and the limit after, it comes to the same answer. You can spread limits across sums. You can spread limits across multiplication as long as both the limits exist. Um, and there's one limit law specifically and very useful, which is about, um, about division. And it says that if you've got, a, it's the only one that says a limit, whether a limit exists or not. And it says that if there is a division inside your limit, and both the top and the bottom exist, and the top and is zero, and the bottom top isn't zero, and the bottom is, then your limit doesn't exist. So this is your limit law number. I think it's number four, but I just call it the limit law for division. So the limit law for division says that if you see the limit of something over something, and these are both functions of say n, then if the, the limit of the top If this limit is not zero and this limit is zero, then this limit doesn't exist. But if they're both not zero, just it's just whatever the answer is. In fact, the only thing you care about is whether the denominator is zero. If the denominator isn't zero, it'll be fine. Just sub it in. And there's one other limit law which says that you can sort of sub limits into each other. Now, if both of those limits don't exist, yeah. Uh, but there's a cool limit law called L'Hopital's rule, named after the person who paid their mathematician to find a theorem for them um, and not the mathematician who found it. And I can't even remember that person's name, the mathematician. So, um, Yes, the earls of, of L'Hopital paid his mathematician to name a theorem after him. So that's what we have. L'Hopital's rule says that if both limits are zero and both or both limits are infinity, then if you differentiate the top and bottom, then the answer doesn't change. It's usually done with X's, but whatever. So it's not to say that, so see these two things, the original functions on each other and the derivatives on each other, those two things are not the same thing. They are different pretty much everywhere. But the way L'Hopital's rule, uh, L'Hopital's rule works is that if these are both zero over zero and you do the derivative, then this fraction will give you the same answer as you go towards infinity as this one does. The individual terms are all different, but they go to the same place. That's what L'Hopital's rule is saying. As a big no-no to write in your working this, because that is wrong. This is right, but this is wrong. They just go to the same place. They're not actually equal. Yeah. It would be like saying two people are the same person if they ate the same meal, um, which they aren't. They just ate the same meal. Same deal here. These two functions are not equal. They just have the same limit. I'm going to stop now. We've talked too long. 
um, tell me something or ask me a question. Would you like a tricky limit question? Okay. Do you have one that's on your mind? I've got one. Um, I'm not going to say, you know, because this will be here for future semesters, I'm not going to say where in the course it is, but it is very familiar to me and the Maths Learning Centre because people ask us about it all the time. So they don't have to go to infinity. It could be just going to anywhere. It doesn't matter as long as it's the thing. Uh, let me just think about this. If the limit of as x goes to a of x squared plus 6x plus a over x plus 3 exists, what is a? This is not, this is like a, an upside down limit question. It's just not, it's not asking you what is the limit. It's asking you what would this location it's heading for go, be if it, the limit did exist? Does anyone have thought, does anyone recognize this question? Okay, it's all good. Um, does anyone have thoughts about how to go about it? Okay. I'm just going to repeat that just to make sure I've got it. You're saying factorize the top to get two roots. So I've got two questions about that. One is why would you do such a thing? Okay, so just in case you've got an x plus three and why would that help? Cancel it out. How does other people feel about that plan? <laughs> does that seem like a plan that usually works? Maybe. So it would be great if we could do that, but we don't know what this number is. So if, just let me just talk this out. If this number was say um, 13, uh, we already completed that square earlier and we know that actually you can't factorize that one. Um, I would think that if X was 13 in this spot, then when you went to 13, the bottom would be, um, 16 and the top would be something huge. So that limit would totally exist. Awesome. So now I should ask, it doesn't exist. <laughs> exactly when would it not exist? Maybe it always, oh damn it, I've done a bad question. Sorry, it's okay. Okay. Sad. Can I answer this question as it is? I reckon this limit always exists no matter what A is, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So if I want to be, yes, cancelling the denominator is a good plan. Um, if I want to, but this limit will exist in two situations. One situation is where the denominator is not zero. Yep. So if X is not, if A, is not minus three, then the limit as X goes to A of X plus three will be A plus three, which is not gonna be zero. So since the limit of the denominator is not zero, totally gonna to exist. Uh, and the limit of the top won't be zero either, but it doesn't matter. The limit of the top is going to be a number. So since, Limit as x goes to a of x squared plus 6x plus a is going to be a squared plus 6a plus a 
which is also which exists and therefore the limit exists so what could what is a anything other than minus three yay ah oh, sorry anything other than minus three um what would happen if a was minus three then you'd get the limit as x goes to minus three of x squared plus six x minus three over x plus three and now the limit of the top is minus three squared plus six times minus three minus three which is nine minus 12 and the limit of the bottom is zero and so therefore the limit of x squared plus 6x minus 3 over x plus 3 as x goes to minus 3 doesn't exist because the top isn't zero and the bottom is well the limit of the top is zero and the limit of the bottom is which is from one of the limit laws so it turns out the answer to this question is what is a anything other than minus 3 what if it had just been this So if the limit as x goes to minus three of x squared plus six x plus a over x plus three exists, what is a? So I know already that the limit as x goes to minus three of x plus three is zero. So if the denominator is zero and the limit exists, the numerator has to be zero too, or infinity. Um, because the, if the top wasn't zero and the bottom was, the limit wouldn't exist. And so the only way that this limit can possibly exist is if the limit of the top is also zero. So for the limit to exist, we need the limit as x goes to minus three of x squared plus six x plus a to also be zero. Because the limit law for division doesn't actually say what happens when the top and the bottom are both zero. It says if the top isn't zero and the bottom is, then it doesn't exist. If the top is um, anything other than zero and the bottom isn't, sorry, if the top is zero, isn't zero and the bottom is, then it doesn't exist. If the top bottom is zero and the top is um, not zero, then it doesn't exist. The bottom isn't zero then it's then it exists and if they're both zero it tells you nothing it doesn't say anything about that situation at all so the only way this could possibly exist is if the top and bottom were both zero it still might not exist anyway but it's the only hope we have and i know what happens to this limit um, that limit is uh, minus three squared plus six times minus three plus a and so a must be rearrangeable from that Yay, so the only way the limit could possibly exist is if A is nine. It still might not exist. Only it will, uh, because we know that when we have X squared plus six X plus nine over X plus three, then that's the same as this. Uh, and I get, this divided by that is just x plus three, oh, which is zero, which is coincidence. Zero over zero sometimes comes out to zero, sometimes it comes out to five million, sometimes it comes out to minus a half, who knows? Sometimes it doesn't exist. If there's a polynomial on both the top and the bottom and the, and the top and the bottom are both zero, you're guaranteed to be able to factorize them both and cancel something because that's how polynomials behave. We like polynomials for that reason. Questions, thoughts? Cool.
I will say one other thing about limits. Uh, there is a limit that we definitely know. The limit as x goes to infinity of one over x is zero. We know this for certain. Because you know, one divided by 5 billion is an extremely small number and one divided by 10 billion is even more extremely small and it just keeps getting smaller and smaller. So it goes to zero. It's never quite equal to zero, but it, it, that's where it's heading. And so if you see something with fractions and the X is going to infinity, a useful thing to do is to arrange to have lots of these in there because then they'll all become zero, which is a useful thing. All right. I'm just flailing around here. So I feel like I want to do something productive now. So that's sequences. Sequences are great. Okay with sequences. Series is the thing that we really wanted to do. Perfectly good. This is a sequence, five comma, five over 10, five over 10 squared, five over 10 cubed. That's a sequence. If you add them up, that's a series. That's the difference between them. And a series has two sequences you can make out of it. One is the sequence made of the individual bits that you're adding up. You can also make a different sequence which is the running total. I call it running total. I believe the official name is the sequence of partial sums. But I feel like running total makes more sense to me. I just keep adding them up as I go and then writing down what the total is so far. The definition of this series, what it adds up to, because it's going forever, is whatever the limit of the running total sequence is. So we have notation for this so that we don't have to keep writing this stuff out. The original series is five over 10 to the N. That's what it was. And this one goes to infinity. This is the running total sequence. Exactly the same, but there is a number here that I stop at each time and I keep changing what this N is. So this is what happens when capital N is zero. This is what happens when capital N is one. This is what happens when capital N is two and so on. So what we're saying is, this is the formal notation. What we mean by going to infinity is the limit as capital N goes to infinity of this thing, which is the limit of the sequence of running totals. So the only way that the, not only way, the official way of telling whether a series has an answer is seeing whether you make the series sequence of running totals and see whether that is seems to be going somewhere. Many functions, the series, series sequence of running totals goes to a number. Many series, the sequence of running totals goes to infinity. Many series, it just keeps flipping back and forth between the same couple of numbers. That's the definition. And the word we use for this actually existing. So the limit exists, pardon me, is the same as saying the series converges. So if all else fails, you can always use that definition if you really feel like it. But that's a lot of work. Because in order to know whether the sequence of running totals 
converges, you're going to need a formula for what this adds up to when you stop at capital N. Um, and that's not necessarily fun. And so we have all these other ways of telling whether series is converged. And we really, really want to know whether series is converged because all the way back here, we had Taylor series like this. And if we want to use this, we want to know whether it actually produces an answer at all. Because if it doesn't, and I, I, can, I can be happy with writing my function as an infinite polynomial as much as I like, but if it doesn't actually produce an answer, then what's the point? So I want to know whether it does or not. I mean, you know, I could stop at like four and be okay with that, uh, but it'd be really nice if it went on forever and it worked because, you know, I can do some fun stuff with that, with that leveraging that infinity at the back end there. So I want to know when they converge. And now we are up to testing whether series converge or not. So there is always the definition if you really want, but try not to because it's really hard. So there's one situation in which the definition of convergence comes up. I mean, I've, I've, I've no idea if your lecturer would be nasty enough to just make you use the definition in not this situation. There's one situation where the de definition comes up, which is the proof of the geometric series converging at certain things. So here is a, um, a power series. Perfectly good power series. This is called the geometric series. And just to be sure, you know what this means, like x to zero is one, and then you've got x, and then you've got x squared, and then you've got x cubed, and so on forever. That's sort of what it is. And this is the short version of it. The sum, which is how you read this capital sigma, from n being zero up to infinity of x to the power of n. That's a geometric series. Currently it's a geometric power series, but if you chose an answer for x, it's just an ordinary geometric series. This will converge depending on what the value of x is. So for some x's it converges and for some x's it doesn't, and it converges when the absolute value of x is less than one. So just to be clear, the sum from n equals zero to infinity of 1.003 to the power of n does not converge because the number in this position is more than one. So if I add this up forever, I will get infinity. Because 1.003 Every time you do a higher power of it, it gets a little bit bigger. And I keep adding things that are bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it might take a very long time for it to be extremely big, but it's still infinitely many things that are a little bit bigger than one. But this, does converge. because this number, its absolute value is less than one. I mean, you don't normally see these with decimals, like it's much more common to see something with a function in it like this. Tell me, does this converge or not? And people are nodding. Why are you saying it converges? Yeah, so three on pi is less than one. Oh yeah, because pi is a bit bigger than three. So three divided by pi must be a little bit less than one. And so therefore it does converge. Classic of them sticking in pies. I mean, it'd be even more fun if they did this, right? You know, yeah, because e is a little bit less than three and pi is a little bit more than three. So this number is less than one. So it does converge. So I have, I, here we go. I have one more thing. What if it started at 100? Would it still converge? People are still nodding? Good. I'm glad that your instincts are good. It still converges. doesn't matter where it starts. Um, and that's a really useful piece of information. It doesn't have to start at zero. But what it does have to do to start at zero is to be this formula.
This is one of the very few infinite series that you have a formula for. So if it is x to the power of n, if you can write it like that way, and if it does start at zero for the power, for the exponent, then the entire infinite series will add up to this answer. If you do those running totals, it will get closer and closer and closer to this. And are you ready? 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 Here we go. Look, look, look. It's a Taylor series. This function has been written as a polynomial, but forever. <gasps> and the center is x equals zero because it's just x and not x minus number. This is one of the reasons we're so interested in Taylor series because they do these things. Okay, sweet. That's, this is where we're going, okay? Right, so how are we going to tell if our series converges? The first way to tell is to check if it's a series that we've seen before. And one of those series is the geometric series. Common series, R. Okay. This one. This has a name, it's called the harmonic series. And it does not converge. In any situation, whoa, yay. In any situation where you see um, a series and it looks like this, then it doesn't converge. It doesn't matter where it starts. Obviously I can't start at zero because I can't do one divided by zero. Um, so that does matter. But if it starts at 500, still doesn't converge. Um, uh, the way that it doesn't converge is very, very slowly. Like, Given any number whatsoever, if you add this up far enough, you can make the running total go above that number. Um, so technically the sum is infinity. Um, yeah. This series does converge. It's the alternating harmonic series. Uh, I believe it converges to LM2. Could be wrong. <laughs> um, these are the, like really important. And I should say it doesn't actually matter um, whether it's N on the bottom. It just has to be a linear function of N. So it could just as easily have been, just so you're at it, also doesn't converge because it's a harmonic series. Harmonic series just requires this thing down here to be linear. So look very closely at what your series looks like uh, because if the numerator is a constant, like this could have been seven and it would have been fine, the numerators are constant, bottom's linear, it will, it's a harmonic series and it doesn't converge. Yay. Sweet. Um, and this is getting at something the way that, lim that, that um, series work. It's about things being of the correct size. Um, this is a constant, this is linear. Things of that size related that way, when you form them into a sequence and then add up the running total, won't produce an answer. This is called a P series.
This will converge as long as P is more than one. And not converge when P is less than or equal to one. Ah, crap. So one over n squared totally converges uh, to pi squared on six, um, I believe, according to my maths one B lecturer back in the day. Um, yeah, he used to say, and that converges to pi squared on six, and I think that's just ace. One of my strongest memories of maths one B. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and if it's one on root n, root n is n to the power of a half, half is less than one, doesn't converge. So this is about comparing this one to the harmonic series, basically. But you don't have to prove this. Um, if, they specific, if they ask you to prove it in an exam, they will give you hints about how to go about doing that. Um, and they'll do things with integrals and upper and lower sums and stuff. So yeah. um, that's basically it. And the other common series are Taylor series. So geometric series. And the Taylor, the Maclaurin series for either pair of X. And I mean, if you're, if you're really good, you probably should be remembering the ones for sine and cos as well, but they're less common just while we're at it. So cos X is the same as E to the X, it just only has the even ones and it switches back and forth between plus and minus. And sine is the same as e to the x, but it only has the odd ones. And it switches back and forth between plus and minus. And if you don't have the plus or minus one, then it's kosh and shine. Wow, everything's connected. Why people who love maths love maths. Hmm. I think I've got that right. Pretty sure it's not two and minus one. Let's just check. When n is zero, I get x to the one. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I know that the sine x starts with an x when you do the Taylor series uh, because um, sine x over x is approximately one. So I don't know if they want you to remember these. But uh, it's not the worst thing to remember them. Um, if you go on to do more mathematics, especially anything involving differential equations, it's not the worst thing to know those. But these definitely. Okay, so here's a question. This thing, okay, you see any of these things, then you know automatically that it converges. Um, these converge no matter what X is, for all x, this one only converges when x is less than one. Of course, the bigger that x is, the longer it takes to settle down into something useful. Yeah. Um, I have a question. What if it doesn't start at zero? Does anyone know how to deal with that? Has someone sent me this question, uh, something like this? Um, they might be in the room. I don't know. Um, so um, I know that if it did start at zero, if that was a zero there, then the answer would be one over one minus two thirds. Yep. Okay, cool. That is a totally excellent answer. So you're saying that this bit would be one over one minus two thirds. 
but we're missing the bit from zero to five and we'll take that off. Cool, that is totally a possibility that you could do. So there's two methods here. There's at least two and that's a good one. Um, if I multiply the top and the bottom by three, I'll get three over three minus two, which is just three. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, but we also know that the bit from n equals zero to five would be whatever it is. And so the answer would be the whole thing minus this stuff. Because that's the bit up to five and we started at six. So we wanted to take the bit up to five off. We don't want to go up to six because then we'd be taking the bit that involves six off and we wanted to leave the six in. That's one way. There is another way. How do people feel about this so far? So this is a really good way if it just starts at one, right? If it starts at n equals one, then, then we only have to take off a tiny bit of stuff. And so that's probably the quickest way. There is another way. So this starts at six, right? So everything's got a two to the two thirds to the power of six in it. If I factorize that bit out, then everything will start at zero instead. These two things are the same answer. What I've done is I've started at zero, but made this an n plus six, so that if I sub in n equals zero, I still get what I would have got if I put n equals six into this one. If I sub in n equals one, I get what I would have got. n equals one here gives me a seven, which is what I would have got if I put n equals seven into that one. And so these two are the same. I took six from here, but I added it here where the n is. And that's a decent mathematical trick that is going to come back if you do more differential equations and is actually, you know, it's in mass one B as well. And that means I can do this. Like that. And this number, if I multiply a whole lot of things by, by a number and add them up, it's the same as adding them up first and then multiplying by that number. It, that's factorizing. And that bit is now the formula I know and love. Yay. Now, I'm not a fan of fractions within fractions. It always looks a bit unfinished when you're in that point. So I would clear this here. That the bottom, the fraction that's inside the bottom of the fraction has a three on the bottom. So if I multiply the top and bottom of the big thing by three, that'll make it go away. Three, three times one is three and two thirds times three is two. That's what it is. I don't know what three to the six is. Uh, six, seven, two, nine. Yay. I mean, this is usually a perfectly good answer if you're in an exam and I'd probably stop there. There you go. It's not a very big number at all. How do people feel about that particular piece of working? Use quite a few sum moves there. Yep. Um, so 
to, so you're saying, does this only work for geometric series? Um, it should work for something that's like an exponential as well, but the factorial might just be a bit weird. Um, and it would only sort of work if the factorial on the bottom was set up to be the correct thing so that when you did this shifting over, it worked out okay. Um, yeah. But this move, this move here, where you separated out the thumb thing to power of six, that should work as long as there's powers of n in it. Yeah. This method will, I mean, this will always work no matter what you've got, this one here. I like that question because it's a really good maths question. Can I reuse this in other situations? <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, it asks about the connections between things, which is totally what maths is about. Mm. Just note that if there was already a number here, you could always pull it out. You sort of have to know that it does converge first to be able to do that, which we do because that is less than one. If it didn't converge, you'd just say, well, it doesn't converge and just leave it at that. There's a classic assignment questions that say like, you know, does this converge? And if it does, what is the, what does it converge to? And that almost always means that it's a geometric series because you've only been told two series that you know the answer to. So, yeah, I mean, if you're in a later course like real analysis, then that'd be a whole other thing, but yeah, nobody cares so much what it converges to. They just care whether it does. <laughs> okay. So they are our common series. And there's a few little fiddling around we have to do to actually figure out what the answer is. Most of the time they won't ask you what the answer is unless it's a geometric series because you just don't know. Um, and uh, you can always get, have a pretty good guess at where it is. There are three other things that allow you to tell whether things converge or not. Um, and they are the alternating series test. No, just a second. There's something before that. So if it's not one of your common series, there are some things you need to look at to decide if it converges or not. And the first one is whether the individual terms as a sequence, not the running total, but the individual terms, whether they go to zero. And it's called the necessary condition for convergence in your notes. But elsewhere in the world, online, if you Google it, you're gonna be looking for the divergence test. Um, Um, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to keep going on this or switch to something else because I talked about this a lot before. Um, but I'm someone, yeah, I did get comprehensive questions about this by two different people, so I'm going to run with it. Okay. And it goes that this thing can only converge when this limit of the individual terms as a sequence goes to zero. If the limit as n goes to infinity of a n, that's a sequence, is zero, uh, is not zero, then this does not converge. If the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is zero, then I don't know whether it converges or not. But I have a hope that it might, because if it doesn't go to zero, then it definitely will not converge. You have no hope and you can stop. But if the individual terms do go to zero, there's a chance it will converge, but it still might not anyway. Sadly. A little bit like the limit laws, you know, zero over zero, not, not zero over zero definitely does not exist, but zero over zero, who knows, same deal. So in your notes, it's actually written the other way around. It says that the only time that this does converge is when the limit of the individual terms is zero. That's what the, the theorem in your notes says. 
but I find that really difficult to process as a rule for deciding if, if sequences exist. So I would prefer to say, if the limit doesn't go to zero, then it doesn't converge. So you should know that anything that has a polynomial over a polynomial, where the top and bottom are the same degree, um, will not converge. If I had something that was like, you know, n cubed plus n squared plus one over n cubed minus five, not that limit. This sum, maybe not zero, let's go one. This sum will not converge. This series will not converge. I know it, it's guaranteed to not converge because this limit is going to be one. So if the top and the bottom are a polynomial um, of the same degree, then the limit will be not zero of the individual terms. You would have to actually show that, but at least you'll know. Because look at this. The only limit I know um, at, at infinity is one over n. So if I'm going to arrange this to have lots of one over n's in it, um, if I divide by the biggest power of n that I see, which is n cubed, then that divided by n cubed, um, will means I can divide each individual piece by n cubed. n cubed divided by n cubed is one. n squared divided by n cubed is one on n. One divided by n cubed is one on n cubed. That divided by n cubed is one, five divided by n cubed is this. And as n goes to infinity, that goes to zero, that goes to zero, and that goes to zero. And I end up with one over one, which is importantly, not zero. And so therefore the series doesn't converge. The sequence does in fact have a limit and the limit is one. But because as a sequence, the limit isn't zero, the series of running totals of that sequence cannot possibly converge because each of these terms is getting closer and closer to one. And when I get far enough out, it's just the same as adding a whole lot of infinitely many ones together, which is just going to give me infinity. How do you feel about that? I like to have things that allow me to make a decision of what to do without having to do all the work first. But you're supposed to have a quick look at what's there and go, does that limit go to zero? Yeah. So this is one where it doesn't, so therefore. Series does not converge. Okay, that's the diversion test. Very important. Then there is the uh, alternating series test, which says that your sequence has to be if you've got a sequence like this and your an happens to be have a minus one to the n in it, like that, so it doesn't really matter what's next to it, as long as a bit next to it doesn't have more minuses, um, then the series will converge as long as this bit goes to zero because it needs to go to zero or it's not going to work based on the previous test. And um, the sizes of these terms get smaller and smaller. So sort of rule zero is it has to be alternating. And then you need the limit as n goes to infinity of the bit without the minus one to the n to go to zero. Oops, sorry, equals zero. And then at some point, you need that bn plus one is always more than bn. Well, I mean, yeah, the absolute value. So at some point you need this to be true for all n beyond the point where you're at. It doesn't have matter at the beginning, it only matters near the end. And so that's why we know the alternating harmonic series converges. 
because um, without the one on n, one on n, not as a series, but as a sequence, definitely goes to zero. So that's good. And one on n plus one, damn it, wrong way around, smaller. The terms have to get smaller. If they get bigger, then it's not going to go to zero. Um, is definitely less than one on n, as long as n is more than one. So yeah, it converges. But you don't actually have to do the alternating series test to prove that that converges. You're allowed to just say it's the alternating harmonic series that converges. Um, so this is only useful for things that have a minus one to the n in them, uh, which almost always is not that useful. But uh, when you do um, power series and you're looking at the two ends of the interval of convergence, one of them is usually an alternating series. And it almost you always almost always converges um, because of the alternating series test. And then there is last, but certainly not least, the ratio test. And the ratio test is designed to compare your series to a geometric series. If it really was a geometric series, then if you could rewrite it, you know, you know, this is the idea behind it. So if it was a geometric series, then all you'd need is for the size of X to be less than one, and then it would converge. And if it really was a geometric series, then when you divided one term by the one before it, it would tell you what X is. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take our series and we're going to go, I don't care if it's a geometric series. I'm just going to do what I would normally do for a geometric series. I'm going to divide each term by the one before it. And that should tell me what the X is. And if the absolute value of that X is less than one, it converges. But it probably doesn't work. <laughs> and so we're just going to hope that if we do it far enough out towards, you know, 5 million or whatever, that it becomes approximately a geometric series. And so we need the limit of this to be, um, the absolute value of that to be less than one. So what we're gonna do is we're going to have a series and we're going to, first we're gonna calculate uh, a n plus one divided by a n, um, the absolute value of it. Then we're going to do the limit of as n goes to infinity of a n plus one divided by a n. And then if that answer, that answer, whatever it is, if that answer is, um, okay, if that answer is less than one, then it converges. If that answer is greater than one, then it definitely does not converge. And if that answer is equal to one, then I have not the slightest clue what's going on. And I feel very sad. <laughs> and if you're in this situation, almost always, it'll be one of the series that you're familiar with. In Mass 1B anyway. <laughs> yeah. And so you would just go, Oh crap, I shouldn't have done the ratio test. Look at it, it's just, it's just the harmonic series, yay. Why did I do the ratio test? Um, yeah, and that's the ratio test. And so it has all these steps and I, I really recommend doing all the steps to literally calculate what this is as a formula first and then do its limit and then look at the limit and make the decision. Um, because otherwise, See, I, I don't like rewriting lim, 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 lim over and over. It's just easier for me to calculate this first. Um, just saves precious milliseconds in an exam situation. Um, you know, and life. Life is too short to write lim n goes to infinity 500 times. Um, some people will argue that it's too short to write lim n goes to infinity at all, but you know, they're sad people because they've been forced to write lim n goes to infinity too much, but yeah. 
Um, I'm okay with it. All right, that's the ratio test. But for me, in my head, it's easiest to understand. I can remember the ratio test much more easily if I go, oh, I'm comparing to what a geometric series does. Um, yeah. And uh, this move of figuring out what the X is that would go in the geometric series thing is a really cool move, actually. Um, and so this is very much like doing Taylor series anyway. It's like, huh, I, I, it's not a geometric series, but what if it was? Like, it's not a polynomial, but what if it was? That's very much a maths thing to do. In fact, derivatives at all are that. It's not a straight line, but what if it was? Um, that's exactly what derivatives are about. And finding tangents and stuff. Okay, those are your tests. Um, and uh, yeah. One day, I should do this like in week 11, when you get to the end of your tests and do, do a series seminar like this to just, or encourage the lecturer to do it, or just, you know, take over one of their videos for, for a, a week. Um, yeah, like I'm going to go over a little bit, because the next one doesn't start till 11.30, so I'll just keep talking and feel free to go if you need to go somewhere. Um, thoughts, questions? about this stuff before I move on. I do have one more thing to say, just while I'm at it. So, um, when we go all the way back to the Taylor polynomials slash series, you know how so there's two ways of dealing with it. One is to go forever and the other one is to stop and figure out how bad it is. I didn't talk about that a bit. Um, and so the very first thing that you said at the beginning was what about these error things? That's a whole thing of its own. And I've got seminars just on the error, but I just want to point out that if your function really does is whatever crap the function really is. And then you've sort of said it's approximately equal to this polynomial. Which is called PNX. You really wanna know how different is it it's guaranteed to be equal at the position when x is equal to a because that really is f of a will come out to what pn of a is as well because the zeros sort of match up um, so you're guaranteed to match at the point where x is equal to a so this is the actual function and then your taylor polynomial will be whatever it is That's the purple there. And at this spot just here, they will match up exactly. And it's probably the only spot that they match up exactly. And the further away you get from this spot, the worse it's gonna be. So when I'm quite close to this, my magnifying glass, there's my function, and there's my Taylor polynomial. They're very close together. And it'll be extremely difficult to tell. But when I'm further apart, further away, my function and my Taylor polynomial are further apart. And I want to know how close do I need to be for it to be, you know, as good as I would like, you know, five decimal places worth of accuracy. Um, or, so that's one question you could ask, how close to the center do you need to be to get a certain level of accuracy? The other question is, well, what if I just had more terms in my Taylor polynomial? Um, maybe that would get it closer. How many terms do I need? There are two different questions you can ask and they sort of come in tension. Um, and Taylor, that's why they're called Taylor polynomials, figured out this awesome theorem that said, um, I don't know, um, but this is a pretty good guess. So it said that if you do this and you approximate f of x with pn of x, which is a Taylor polynomial, um, 
degree and center A, then the difference between your actual function and the polynomial itself, um, which is what we want to know, then what we're going to say is we're going to say that f of x is pn of x plus a bit. And this is called the error or the remainder. Does your lecturer use r or e or what? So other places in the world use r for this. I shall call it e today. Um, it's E for error or R for remainder, and remainder literally means leftover bit. Um, <sighs> ditto. But the idea is that you've got your function to calculate your function, you calculate the Taylor polynomial first, and then there's this leftover bit that makes it the correct answer. And for most functions that we're familiar with these days, we can calculate this to great levels of accuracy. And if we want to know the error, we would just figure out them both and subtract. But imagine living in a land where you, you knew theoretically what this function was, like sine of x, but you didn't actually know how to calculate the exact answer for it. What is sine of two degrees? I don't know. Um, and your calculator do, can do that, and it's actually using a Taylor polynomial to do that, um, especially a TI. Casio is probably using that plus a couple of other extra whiz bang cool things, but you know, that's Casio and it's, it's very clean and blue um, so what taylor did he said look if you don't know how to calculate f of x to a great degree of accuracy then it's going to be extremely difficult to figure out how bad your polynomial approximation of it is but i've got this this cool idea it can't be any worse than this All right, so this bit, so if you're going to do a Taylor polynomial, you get all the way up to here, and then the next term, if you want to do the next Taylor polynomial, would be a n plus 1, x minus a to the n plus 1. And to figure out that a n plus 1, you do f n plus 1 derivative, and you sub in a, and you divide by n plus 1 factorial. This is what the next term in the Taylor polynomial would be. And definitely, it is, if your function isn't a polynomial, this is not the error. Because the error would be all the rest of the infinitely many things. And so this is the wrong answer if you put A in this spot. But what Taylor said was, yes, it is the wrong answer if you put A in this spot, but there is a number you can put in that spot and it will be the right answer. And your lecturer in your notes uses uh, the Greek letter psi. Sometimes people pronounce it Z, but like if you're going to call it Z, then you have to call this letter P, which is what they do call it in Greek, but we've already got P in English. And so, you know, sorry, that's just a really bad reason that it's high. But aren't, aren't you happy with, proud of my writing Xi? Comes from the fact that the capital Xi is just three lines and you're going to connect those lines together. <sighs> Took me decades to figure out how to do that. <laughs> um, some people would just prefer to write the letter Z in that spot. Um, and that's fine as well. For some psi between A and the X I'm thinking of. So what Taylor did is he said, yes, I know that the next term in the Taylor polynomial is the wrong number to put in this spot to get the correct error, but there is a number that will go in that spot, but I don't know what it is. But I do know that it's somewhere between the, the center A and the X I'm thinking of. I don't know what it is, but there is one. There is definitely a correct answer, but I don't know what it is. And why does this help? Well, so it's always nice to know there is an answer, I guess. But it also helps because that means that if you, you since you know the options for what this, this letter Xi could be, if you run through all those options, and whichever of them is the biggest possible error, it can't possibly be any worse than that. That's the idea behind it. And so if you want to use 
Taylor's error formula to figure this out, you normally do the absolute value of it because you don't care whether it's plus or minus. So this technically, will, the theorem actually says that there is a number that will give you the correct plus or minus as well, but you don't care. Um, you're going to choose, you're going to do the absolute value, and then you're going to think about which values of psi make this answer the biggest it can possibly be, B, and then whichever is the correct value of psi has got to give an error that's not as bad as that. And so there's always going to be a less than or equal to at the end. So it'll be something like, oh, I don't want to do it. Actually, no. <laughs> Um, and then you've got like the the like third Taylor polynomial, and the error in the third Taylor polynomial when figuring out sine of pi on six. Say, just making up some random thing. Um, let's just estimate this. And so we know that f dashed is cos. And f double dashed is minus sine, and f triple dashed is minus cos. And we're doing the third Taylor polynomial. So to do the error, we're going to need the fourth derivative because we need to go to the next one. Back to sine again. Yay! That was nice of me. Um, and so I know that there is. A number psi such that at x equals zero. Sorry, I didn't tell you what the center is. Sorry about that. So x equals zero means it's x minus zero in this spot. Um, it's the third error, which means I have to use the fourth derivative in the fourth power. Um, so some psi between zero and pi on six. That's what the theorem says, uh, which means that this will be, and this will be a pi on six in this spot here. And so this will be uh, sine of pi on six. No, sine of psi. Pi on six to the four over 24. So where's the biggest error? That's the question. I know that there is a number psi somewhere between zero and pi on six that makes this the correct error, but I don't know which one is the right one. So I'm just gonna do worst case scenario. So this bit and this bit don't really change whether it's bigger or smaller than the other ones. It's this bit that makes the difference. So I'm going to imagine what sine of that of psi is between zero and pi on six. Sine goes up like that. This is sine of psi. And so the biggest answer for sine of psi is sine of pi on six. Oh, which is... A half. Yay. Okay. And so therefore, the error must be less than or equal to a half, which is whatever it is. That's where I get my calculator, which can do powers. And it's okay to do powers in your calculator for this, because the whole point of this is to do things with powers instead of Um, instead of everything else. So we're allowed to use powers. Cool. So we've got uh, at least two decimal places of accuracy, probably more, but this, this much, nearly three. Um, 
cool. Yay, that's about it. I mean, and then there's all these other things where you go, oh, cool. Um, what should my center, what if my center had been something else? Um, what if, what if my, I mean, the best center is of course, plan C6, if you're going to kind of find the sign of plan six, but that seems like it's quite a bit of circular reasoning. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you have to choose which end it is at. Um, and it's often at the center um, for a lot of the problems that they give you, but it can be at the point you're at. Um, yeah, and it's actually okay to just pick a number that you know is definitely bigger than everything you've got. Like if I was using sine and I didn't want to do this diagram, I would just put one in this spot because sine is always less than one. And it's definitely going to be less than that. So if you're not sure, then pick a number you know is less, is, is greater than all of them. Yeah. Well, I know I've gone over, but I'll keep going. Um, cool. How do people feel about that? I remember that bit being just completely bamboozling when I was in first year. And I just went, I hope that's not in the exam. <laughs> um, and uh, sometimes that's your best approach when you're only a day out from the exam. <laughs> but we're a week out from the exam. Well, a little bit less than that, I think. Um, so you've got several days to come and talk more about it if you want. Um, I'll be doing revision seminars in the mornings this week. I'll be in there in the afternoon, but the rest of the staff are good at this stuff too. But if you want to specifically ask me about something I said, I'll be there in the afternoons. Um, cool. I did have one thing I wanted to say since you asked about the big O. Um, I'm going to try and say something about big O notation. The definition in the notes, which I took a photo of, um, is bamboozling it says a function of h is of the order of h to the power of n when The limit as h goes to zero of g of h over h to the power of n. And it says in the notes less than infinity, but what that means is it exists, right? It's an actual number. And that definition is um, not helpful to me. Um, it doesn't help that make sense to me. Uh, but I can try and make I can try and make sense of it. It basically says that this thing is in some sense smaller than h to the power of n. Um, crap, crap, crap! Just a second. So if h is going to zero, sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Right. Um, ignore that for a moment it stresses me out um, my understanding of the way that people talk this is the definition in the notes um, but i'm going to take a sociological approach and think about the way mathematicians and math lecturers seem to talk about order instead um, i can probably connect this definition to it if i want but at the moment i think just doing the sociology of it and just like let's just do some anthropology and 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 some some linguistics and just watch them talk about it Go, I can talk about it in those ways. So in my head, it's of this flavor. If you've got a function, which is a Taylor polynomial, um, you've got a function, which is a Taylor polynomial, right? And it has, you know, a naught plus a one h plus a two h squared, and so on, right? If it doesn't start until h to the power of n, then it's order h to the power of n. So this thing um, would be of order one because it starts at the h to the power of at this constant term. 
Whereas this one, then G is of order H to the cubed. It doesn't start until H cubed when you find its Taylor polynomial. That's being order H cubed. That's my understanding of it. So you ready? Here we go. Okay. So my understanding of the way they talk about it is this. This is even better. No, no, that's this is what don't. This. I've got it. I've got it. Here we go. Okay, plus crap. So you know when I said plus crap? That bit is of order h to the four because it starts at h to the four. That's how mathematicians talk about it when they talk about something being of order something. Now, in order to figure out what this bit is, I would need to do powers of h to the four or above because this starts at h to the four and then h to the five and h to the six and whatever. And that's the idea behind it, as far as I can tell. There you go. So this would be A0 plus order H. It's A0 plus A1H plus order H squared. It's A0 plus A1H plus A2H squared plus order H cubed, and so on. So it's basically saying what people, they use it in this situation exactly, that when it's of order that I would say this function is linear except for the bit missing is of order h cubed. Which means that if h is very small, then order h cubed is very, very, very small. Yeah, approximately. Yeah, I know that might not help, but that's my understanding of how they use it. Um, they use it as if it means of the same size as about what h cubed does. But it could be like 10,000 times bigger than that. It's just that as the h shrinks, your function shrinks the same way. So um, hmm, let me think about that just a second. Oh, yes, that goes all the way back to the original. Yeah, got it. Just took me a while. So if you've got a, if you've got like f of x, three x squared plus five, um, and then I'm going to make x go to zero. And I know that the answer should go to five when x goes to zero. Um, and then if I had so this other function, which is going to be um, m of h, which is just h squared. I know these are of the same order because they're, um, nope, nope. No, I no, I don't like it. I don't. I thought I had it. It's slippery. But they use it in this context. So the bit left over. So there's this bit and then there's this leftover bit. And so the idea is that if that leftover bit is order h cubed, then I know that when h cubed, if h goes from 0 0.1, from 1 to 0 0.1, yep, then h cubed goes from one to zero point zero zero one. Okay. Another function that's of order h cubed, it might be that if h goes from one to zero point one, then h then my function goes from like five hundred to zero point zero zero five. Like sorry. To zero point five. So this one, if h changes from one to 0 0.1, then h cubed goes from one to 0 0.001. A function that is of order h cubed, it might go from 500 to 0.5 because that's the same sized change. 
that's how a function of order of h cubed behaves. Um, things will decrease um, in terms of multiplying in the same way. This one will, if this one goes a tenth, then h cubed will be a thousandth. If this one is a tenth the size, then the answer will be a thousandth the size as well. That's the idea. Um, but it ultimately means this, that when someone says to you that, some, that something is of order h cubed, like that, the, the error is of order h cubed, it means that um, it matches its Taylor series up to the third power, basically. Yeah, I'm very confused by it. Um, and then over in computer science, it's different again because they're worried about not h going to zero, but h going to infinity. And then they're worried about order the other direction, which is a whole different thing entirely. So, yeah. Um, but I'm very close to understanding it slightly better now. But um, I know that if, if someone said to me, yeah, and I know there's something that's order h cubed, if I times it by h, it will become order h to the four um, because it behaves the way h cubed works. I hope that is at all helpful in some way. Um, but I find that, that that sociological approach of listening to the way they talk when they talk about it and saying, can I talk that way in the same situations um, is sometimes the first step to making sense of it. Um, because often, even if you understand the concept, then they still talk about it in this weird ass way. You're gonna need them both anyway. Um, so it's a bit like with the sequences, right? They talk about, you might understand a Taylor polynomial and understand that you've got to sub in that value of A or whatever it is, but you have to then know that they talk about it as a center or at or about or around as well on top of that. So you've got to have to do the language stuff anyway. So you might as well start there if you don't understand the concept. It's, yeah, it sounds like such a cop out, um, but it's a good place to start. Um, and I'm sure that many people uh, talk about imposter syndrome in, the, in academia and it's very like that. Sometimes you just feel like you're, talking the way they talk in the hope that nobody notices you don't understand it'd be better to understand but the talk is a first step sometimes all right um cool i do want to do one last thing because you deserve this except let me look at the chat the um big o notation Um, does um, apply when, when it increases. It's just that when you say that something's of order h cubed, when you're doing approximations in this context of, of um, cap, you know, Taylor series and stuff, then order h cubed is better than order h squared um, because it tends to be closer to the correct answer because your h's are small. If h is 0.1, then h cubed is smaller than h squared is. Um, but in computer science, you use order, you, they tend to use big O notation to talk about the complexity of an algorithm and how, how long it takes for the computer to do the algorithm. And in that case, H cubed is bigger than H squared and is worse. Um, and so in computer science, um, order H cubed, and it won't be H, it'll be N, order N cubed is worse than order N squared. You want the N, you want it to be as small as possible. But in, in the Taylor series approximations, you want your order to be as big as possible uh, because you want it to be, because for small numbers, when you do high powers, the answer, the error is smaller. So that's the difference. It still applies, but you, you're looking for a different result, which can be confusing. Yeah. Okay. I did want to say one last thing, which is about orthogonal projection, because I want to do something that I haven't done in a few years. Um, that will, I think is fun. So, okay. There's a whole different tack. Orthogonal projection is a little difficult to process in um, the notes. So, the first thing to note is that in Mass 1b, there is no other kind of projection than orthogonal projection. You would think that, if, that you know, having an adjective like orthogonal would mean that there would be other kinds of projection, and there are. 
but in mass 1b and most of the time you don't care about any of those other ones and you just want the orthogonal projection okay and the point of the orthogonal projection uh, in the general sense is that you may be living in r whatever and there is a subspace which I call capital, I shall call capital W. Uh, and this subspace has whatever dimension it has. Maybe we're in R3 and this subspace is a plane. Maybe we're in R4 and that subspace is a line. Maybe we're in R57 and that subspace is a 17 dimensional subspace. It doesn't matter, but it's most common to be in R3 and project onto a plane. Okay. Well, I know for certain that any that the zero vector is in the subspace because all subspaces have the zero vector in them. Um, I draw it as a, as a as an oval, but it really goes on forever. But in my head, anything that's above two dimensions is just a blob. Um, so this subspace has a basis. And every vector in this subspace can be written in terms of the basis. So if I'm going to have some vector, I shall call it little v. And I'm not going to call it little w because um, it's just a little hard to hear the difference if you're only listening. So I'm going to have v in, in big W. Um, and this vector v, I know it can be written as a linear combination of the basis. So if I've got a basis, which will be called u1 and u2 and u3, then V is going to be something times U1 plus something times U2 plus something times U3. That is always true if you've got a basis. That's what a basis is for. It's specifically designed so that everything in the subspace can be written as a combination. And that must mean there is a choice of numbers in that goes in these spots. At the moment, it's feeling very like Taylor's theorem. Hey, there's a number I can put in this spot that'll work. And there are many ways to find it, and a lot of them use row operations. But if we are very lucky and have exactly the right kind of basis, then there's a calculation we can do to figure out what these numbers are. If my basis is an orthonormal basis, meaning they're all at right angles to each other, and they're all length one, If it's orthonormal, then the number in this spot next to the u1 is v dot u1. And the number in this spot next to u2 is v dot u2. And the number in this spot next to u3 is v dot u3. If it's an orthonormal basis, that will happen. So instead of doing all the things where you put columns next to columns, vectors as columns and your answer there and you row reduce and it tells you what the numbers are, if it's an orthonormal basis, all I have to do is use dot products and it will do that trick, which is really cool. Okay, sweet. That's part one. So part two is, what if you've got a vector that isn't in the subspace? What then? Well, it's obviously not going to, I should not use the word obviously. <laughs> um, it's not going to be able to be made out of these three vectors because the only vectors that can be made out of those vectors are the vectors in your subspace W. All the vectors that can be made from those are in W because W is the span of its basis. So if it's not in W, it can't be built over out of those vectors, which is sad. Um, but it's possible to write your vector as a piece that is in W and another piece that isn't in W. And I mean, there's lots of ways of doing that. You could choose every possible vector in W and then there'd be an answer for the leftover bit. But there is one vector so that the leftover bit is orthogonal to W. So when we talk about orthogonal projection, what we're doing, projection of any kind, is taking every vector everywhere and finding a matching vector in W to go with it. Turning it into a vector that is in W. That's the goal of projection. 
So in essence, it would be nicer if this vector was pointing downwards, right? Because we're turning V into something that's in W. It's orthogonal projection if the action of going from V to the correct position in W, if that direction is orthogonal to W itself. So it is technically possible to have like a 60 degree projection if the direction vector is at 60 degrees to W and that would work too, but we just don't worry about that sort of thing. Um, so that's the idea. It is possible to write V as two pieces, something that's in W, plus something orthogonal to W. Now we don't really care about this something orthogonal to W most of the time, but what we do care about is finding a formula that will give me this bit. And here is the magic trick. Are you ready for the magic trick? The magic trick is this. I want to project this vector V onto big W. That's right. Yes, that's how you write it. And so the answer will be something that's in W, which means that the answer will be something times U1 plus something times U2 plus something times U3, et cetera. Right? I have to figure out what the, because anything, everything that's in W, including the answer to this problem of the projection, is a combination of U1 and U2 and U3. And I just need to figure out what the correct numbers are. The magic trick is it's the same as the correct numbers were, even if it was in W to begin with. This is still V dot U1. And this is still V dot U2. And this is still V dot U3, as long as U1 and U2 and U3 are an orthonormal basis. That is the magic trick. If you're in V already, then this will be V. If you're not in V already, then it will be something that's in big W. If, sorry, if you're in big W already, this will be the vector you started with. If it's not in big W already, it will be a vector in big W. And the, the action that goes from V to that spot will be perpendicular to W as well. <gasps> so cool. Yeah. So the big question is, how do you find an orthonormal basis? Because we can't do this process. I mean, it's technically possible to do this without an orthonormal basis, but it's hard. How do you find an orthonormal basis if you don't have one already? And what you do, so how do you get one? What you do is first you find a basis by whatever methods you have for finding a basis, which is often solving the linear equations or, you know, it's got a span and you do some row operations and find which of them are independent. You have to have a basis first and then you have to do the Gram-Schmidt process. So step zero, have a basis, which, may, which is not orthonormal already. I mean, if it's already orthonormal, then you're good. And orthonormal means that they're all length one and they're all orthogonal to each other. Step one, then, so yeah, step one, the Gram-Smith process. I don't think there's a D. I don't know how many letters, silent letters there are in Gram-Smith. <laughs> It is DT, damn it. All the silent letters. Um, actually, um, the M is silent too. Sorry, very bad joke. Um, okay, so um, have a basis and then do the Gram-Schmidt process. <laughs> and are you ready? The Gram-Schmidt process has um, um, as many steps as there are vectors. You have to turn your, your um, existing basis into an orthonormal basis one vector at a time. So what will happen, your lecture probably starts with U's and ends with V's, don't they? Stuff them. I'm ending with U's because they're unit vectors, because they're length one. So what you'll do first is you'll turn this one into a unit vector and you won't have changed these ones yet. 
And then you'll turn this one into a unit vector and you won't have changed these ones yet. And then you'll turn this one into a unit vector and you won't have changed these ones yet. And you'll keep going one at a time. But the point is that you're going to use this one to change this into that. And then you're gonna use these two to change this into that and so on. Just a couple of minutes to go. So <clears throat> here is the Graham Schmidt process song to the tune of Fairyland Clickety Clock from the TV show, The Fairies, used by permission from Jen Watts, the writer of The Fairies. Okay, she was quite, um, yeah, she, she, she really didn't know what to do with my request. So um, <laughs> anyway, it goes. <clears throat> we use a gram Schmidt process because we need to find an orthonormal basis. And to start, we normalize, project, subtract, normalize, project, subtract, normalize, project, subtract, normalize time. That's the song. Um, and every step except the first one has three pieces. Project, subtract, normalize. So here we go. First, you will project. Uh, first, you will normalize. So you will go V1 divided by its length, and that will be U1. And then the next step, you will project. So you'll find the projection of U2 onto the ones you have so far. And that will be u1 dot u2, sorry, v1, projection of the ve second vector you have already onto the vectors you have so far. So the vector you have so far is u1, and the coefficient that goes with that is v2 dot u1. And that will be an answer. And then you'll subtract. So V2 dash will be V2 minus the projection onto U1 of V2, the thing that we just calculated. And then you'll normalize. V2, U2 will be V2 dash divided by the length of V2. Feel free to come in. And then you'll do it again. You'll project um, V3 onto the ones you have so far. So that will be some multiple of U1 plus some multiple of u2, and the correct multiple is v3 dot u1, and the correct multiple is v3 dot u2. And then you'll subtract. So v3 minus the projection, and that will be v3 dashed, and then you'll do v3 dash divided by its length, and that will be uh, u3, and so on. I find it easier to process this in that order, just in case it wanted, but I just really wanted to sing the, the ortho, orthonormal basis song. So thank you very much. I wish you um, clear thinking uh, and calm nerves and, and um, helpful technology during your exam. And don't forget you can come and talk to us before that. Thank you.